We can go ahead and dive right in. For those of you who haven't met me yet, my name is Amelia Wald. I'm the Executive Director of the Virginia Club of New York. I see many familiar names and faces and a few new faces, which is always so exciting for us. We are so, so, so excited to have Sam and Neil and Madeline with us tonight. So I'm gonna turn the conversation over to them because I know that they are the ones that you're interested in hearing from, but I look forward to coming back for audience Q&A at the end. So welcome. Um... Thank you, Amelia, um, for the invitation to speak tonight. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, we're really excited to talk about this project with you. Um, and I'd also like to thank our primary funders, the Jefferson Trust, whose funding made this project possible. So Sam, Neil, and myself are all current or recently graduated PhD students in the English department at UVA. Um, our research sort of an aggregate focuses on book history and bibliography. Tonight, we're gonna to take you through our Rotunda Planetarium project in three parts. So I'm gonna give some background on the history behind the planetarium. Sam is gonna discuss our process of creating the project and Neil is gonna talk about the exhibition um, and some of the programming that we hosted in concert with that. Um, so Sam, if you could go to the first slide. Okay. So in 1819, Thomas Jefferson was in the midst of planning the University of Virginia. The rows and houses, um, the, the rows of houses and classrooms in the UVA lawn had already been built. The basic architecture of the university was in place, um, but Jefferson was still in the process of designing the architectural centerpiece of the university, which as many of you know, um, is the rotunda, the large dome top building that's modeled on the Pantheon in Rome. Next slide. Jefferson's plan for the rotunda was very ambitious for its time. Um, as designed, it was to have three stories and include space for a natural history museum, chemical laboratories, and classrooms. The top floor of the building was to be the dome room um, with a ceiling that curved up to a glass covered oculus or a skylight. So when the rotunda opened in 1826, the dome room ceiling, ceiling was just plain, white plaster. Um, but this was not always the plan. Jefferson's notebooks from 1819 contain an unusual idea for the rotunda that if he had been able to execute it, um, would have made the building the first planetarium-like structure in the United States. And on this next slide, um, you can see an image of that notebook, and this is what Jefferson writes. The concave ceiling of the rotunda is proposed to be painted sky blue and spangled with gilt stars in their position and magnitude, copied exactly from any selected hemisphere of our latitude. A seat for the operator, movable and fixable at any point in the concave will be necessary, and means of giving to every star its exact position. So this plan didn't explicitly propose a model of the solar system. Um, so it may, it may be a little bit of a stretch for us to call this a planetarium, but it would have allowed early University of Virginia faculty to manipulate movable stars and represent the progress of constellations across the night sky. I wanna talk a little bit about some possible inspirations for this idea. Um, and then I'll say a little bit more about how Jefferson's own plan might actually have worked. Um, so on this next slide, you can see that ceilings with stars or constellations are not a new phenomenon. Um, this image shows a carved ceiling from Egypt created around 50 BCE. Um, in the center, you have the North Pole star, which is surrounded by constellations uh, represented here as signs of the zodiac. And um, apparently the design also depicts two solar eclipses. This next image is another later example of a star ceiling found in a 12th century Chinese tomb. And this tomb actually has a domed ceiling painted with constellations, which are the dots and lines that you can see depicted here. So there's no evidence that Jefferson knew anything about structures like these, um, but I'm showing them to make the point that star painted ceilings have been around for a really long time. It is more likely that Jefferson would have heard about astronomical displays in Europe. And on this next slide, um, you can see the Ice Isinga Planetarium in the Netherlands, which was built in the late 18th century by Isinga, who was an amateur astronomer. It's, it's basically a mechanical orrery or model of the solar system. 
that hangs down from the ceiling and rotates under the power of a pendulum clock. Um, it's also still working today, which is pretty remarkable. This next image um, is not a ceiling, but it's another possible European inspiration. Uh, the globe of Gottorf, which German craftsmen built for Peter the Great during the 17th century. It's a 3.1 meter diameter globe um, that rotates by water power. And the idea was that you could sit inside and watch mechanical constellations kind of move across the sky. So these structures are really cool. And I think they're a testament to the artistic as well as scientific innovation that has historically accompanied interest in astronomy. But since the three of us are scholars of literature, um, there's one further possibility that we wanna float. So Jefferson, as you may know, was an admirer of the French philosopher and writer Voltaire. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, uh, in Voltaire's novella, The Princess of Babylon, Voltaire imagines a planetarium in the gardens of his fictional Babylon. And in this passage, Voltaire describes, quote, a circular room 300 feet in diameter with a vaulted roof painted blue and seated with golden stars representing all the constellations and planets, each in its true position. He also writes that the spangled vault rotated so that the sky was moved by machines as invisible as those that move the cosmos. And so if you compare these passages from Voltaire and Jefferson, um, I think the similarities are quite suggestive. Obviously the Voltaire is in translation here, um, but you can see in this next slide that the basic idea he proposes maps pretty well onto Jefferson's plan. So in each passage, you have a painted blue ceiling. Um, you also have gold stars. And finally, you have an interest in scientific accuracy. So stars in their exact position or their true position. So we'll never know for sure what inspired Jefferson, um, but we do know a bit more about how he thought this idea would work. This next image is Jefferson's labeled diagram of this planetarium. Um, and specifically, it's a diagram of the boom and pulley lift that would elevate an operator to give lectures and point to stars on the rotunda ceiling. The design is, is basically completely unsafe. Um, if we could go to this next slide here. So an operator would sit in a horse saddle affixed to a thin oak boom or basically a, a pole mounted on the floor of the dome room. This boom could be raised and lowered by a rope allowing the operator to travel around the dome. And um, we actually had a mechanical engineer look at the dimensions that Jefferson proposed for the wooden boom and he concluded that it would have been incredibly bendy. So the person sitting on the horse saddle would kind of be flying everywhere. And then um, finally on this next slide, just pointing out that there would have been a fixed wooden rib on the interior of the dome, kind of like construction scaffolding. And a person could have climbed up this to adjust the gilt stars in their different quadrants, moving the stars as the year progressed and the constellations changed positions. Um, I want to point out that when the rotunda opened in 1826, the people who would have climbed up the frame to do this star adjusting could likely have been enslaved. Um, we know that one enslaved man whose name was Louis Commodore was charged with the upkeep of the early rotunda and actually lived in the building for some time. Commodore also helped run experiments conducted in the chemical hearth located on the rotunda's ground floor. And if you've been to the rotunda recently, that hearth has actually been um, excavated, so it's, it's visible to the public as part of an exhibit, which is very cool. Um, unfortunately, we have limited records about Commodore's life, but he's described in one letter written by an early UVA student as having, quote, a smart practical knowledge of chemistry. And in another letter, a student describes him as, quote, a classical scholar. So just to kind of zoom out for a moment, um, at the same time that Thomas Jefferson is promoting racist theories about the abilities of people of African descent in his writings, um, most fam famously in Notes on the State of Virginia. Uh, the university that he's creating could not exist without the intellectual and scientific labor, as well as physical labor of black workers like Lewis Commodore. Um, and if we could go to this next slide, um, if you're interested in learning more about this history, I would really recommend um, checking out Educated in Tyranny, Slavery at Thomas Jefferson's University, which um, 
includes a chapter on Lewis Commodore and um, surfaces a lot of research that people at UVA and beyond have been doing about the legacy of slavery at UVA. Okay, this next slide. Um, so what Commodore ends up doing in the Rotunda Dome Room, instead of moving around constellations, is keeping the library in order. And that's because Jefferson abandons his planetarium idea and the dorm room becomes the University of Virginia's first library. We don't know exactly why. Um, we do know that Jefferson is still considering the plan as late as July 1824, when he writes to John Vaughn, who's the then librarian of the American Philosophical Society. And Jefferson asks if there are any fresco painters in Philadelphia. And as he tells Vaughn, quote, we shall need one to paint the ceiling of our rotunda. Uh, unfortunately, Vaughn informs Jefferson that no, there aren't any fresco painters uh, around. Jefferson's probably gonna need to employ an artist from Europe. And at this point, there already have been a lot of delays to the rotunda's construction. Jefferson is way over budget and the dome stays unadorned. That said, Jefferson remained committed to teaching astronomy at the University of Virginia. Um, this is a little unusual because most early 19th century American universities are not that focused on the sciences. Jefferson, however, um, invested a lot of money in buying astronomical instruments. He also purchased hundreds of scientific books, including a large collection of astronomy books for the Rotunda Library. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Sam and he's gonna talk a little bit more about how he brought the planetarium to life. Thanks, Madeline, and hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I'm Sam Lemley, and uh, as Madeline hinted at the beginning, uh, I'm going to use my time to kind of talk about how uh, Rotunda Planetarium evolved from our research, um, particularly into the history of UVA's first library, and to share some of the technology that makes uh, the installation kind of tick. Um, and I think that this is a great transition that Madeline, uh, the fact that Madeline ended uh, with the discussion of the library, because the first point that I want to make is that um, Rotunda Planetarium really emerged directly from our research into um, the library. Um, you know, all three of us at, at that point were um, PhD students in the English department, and we'd sort of taken on this project as something of an academic side hustle. Um, and you know, in retrospect, uh, that was pretty ill-advised. You know, it's it's never a good idea, particularly in the current job market, um, to distract yourself with something else when your dissertation is still unwritten. So, I think it's a testament to to Madeline and, and Neil's work ethic and just scholarly disposition that they took this on in addition to everything else they're doing. Um, you know, kind of at my instigation. Um, so, thank you to them. Um, so. Um, Anyway, so there, there's there's something um, about the history of the Rotunda Library and its books that kind of held our attention, right? And I think I think Madeline and Neil will agree that we were fascinated by the kinds of arch archival discoveries that we were making pretty regularly in UVA's special collections libraries. Um, you know, most broadly, we were finding, um, for example, that a number of books from the original library survive on campus. Um, and that was uh, a huge revelation because um, for, for most of you know, the last century or more, um, it had always been assumed that the books in the library were lost in a fire that basically gutted the rotunda in October, 1895. So um, you know, in sort of digging through the evidence, we were finding books with original shelf labels from the rotunda um, in special collections at UVA. So, there's there's this arc this sort of untapped archive um, to uh, yeah surface a lot a lot of interesting things about about the history of the Rotunda Library, um, but maybe it, it might be helpful to give a more specific example of some of the things we were finding uh, in our research. Um, so there's there's this story about Thomas Jefferson uh, that we know because William Wharton Baker, who was the second librarian of UVA, records it. Right, it's something that he remembers for the rest of his life. Um, and writes about it repeatedly in his correspondence. But um, the story goes that Jefferson, who was at that point you know, very frail and in failing health, kind of descends from Monticello to check on the progress of the rotunda. 
um, and to kind of inspect its books, right, that had just begun arriving uh, in Charlottesville. Uh, and he sort of goes into the rotunda and he's looking over the books, looking around, and um, Jefferson stops at one volume and uh, says something like, you know, you, you shouldn't have accepted that book. Um, and Wharton Baker says, well, why? Like, what's wrong with it? Uh, and Jefferson says that the label on the spine is actually misspelled. Uh, he says it's Gibbon's Roman Empire, not Gibborn's. Uh, and he takes the book off the shelf um, and hands it to Wharton Baker so that he can expect, inspect it himself. And sure enough, like it's, it's misspelled. So um, the cool thing is that this book survives, right? This is one of the books that we found uh, in special collections. And there, <laughs> there's, the, um, there's the offending label uh, with Gibborn's instead of Gibbon, Gibbons. Um, and then the little diamond shape above that is actually the original shelf mark that, that was used in, in the Rotunda Library. Um, so this is really cool, right? I mean, it's amazing. Uh, it's, it's a perfect example of the kind of thing, uh, the kind of serendipitous survival, right? That we as scholars and historians of the book really look for in our research. Um, so we, we kept working in this fairly scholarly mode, right? Looking for things like this, researching the university's first books uh, and finding really cool things. Um, but we kept circling back to the idea that uh, there was really no great way to um, you know, share some of the things we were finding with uh, the broadest possible audience, right? Uh, conventionally, you know, we would have published an article in an academic journal that, you know, someone would cite kind of once a decade. Um, but so much of what we were finding, we felt kind of had an immediacy and a really broad appeal. Uh, and we wanted to avoid relegating our work to a merely academic audience, right? So that's, that's sort of the point of origin of the Rotunda Planetarium, right? The question of, okay, how can we bring as many people as possible um, in and share what we'd learned, not only about the building, the Rotunda, um, but the library uh, too, in, in a format that was you know, uh, immersive and fun uh, and it's something that gives back to UVA uh, and to the Charlottesville community, right? That was, that was the objective. Um, oops. So um, the, the other point I wanna make kind of in preface, preface, I know this is a really long preface, um, but I also wanna point out that Rotunda Planetarium was not always a sure, a sure thing, right? Um, the, you know, the university eventually threw its weight behind the idea uh, and it was a huge success as a result of that support, but that uh, wasn't always guaranteed, right? Uh, and I think we're probably far enough from the launch where we can admit this. Um, but you know, once once we decided to reconstruct Jefferson's Celestial Dome, uh, we really we ran up against the formidable Jefferson mania and uh, reverence for the rotunda that most of you in the audience, I'm sure, will will recognize. Um, I mean, imagine the conversations we would have to have and navigate uh, once we announced right that we wanted to change something about the rotunda. Uh, so we weren't exactly expecting a receptive audience at first. Um, you know, this is a, not only a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but it's it's the, the centerpiece of Jefferson's grounds, right? Um, so all that is to say, like it's it's kind of an example of asking for forgiveness rather than permission, um, or you know, it, it might be better to say that we were kind of careful to secure funding and backing for the project before proposing it to the university and Rotunda staff. Um, so, you know, and that's, that's kind of what we did, right? We, of course, we pitched it to the Jefferson Trust, uh, who designed, decided to fund it fully. Uh, and so with that financial support and with the authority of the trust behind us, we then approached, uh, the Rotunda, uh, the Rotunda's administrative staff, um, and kind of presented the project as a fait accompli, right? And they were, I think they were gracious enough to kind of see through the ruse, but still go along with it anyway. Uh, and we're very grateful to them for that. Um, Okay, so I'm a bit off track, um, but I, I think I, I make this point because this was kind of our second challenge, right? If the first was to find a way to share our fairly esoteric research um, in an immersive, engrossing way, um, I think the second challenge was to do so uh, in a way that didn't permanently change anything about the rotunda, right? You really need to plan it through to make sure that um, the university would go along with it, right? Um, so yeah, so I think that explains uh, the solution and the technology that we came up with to actually put together the projection. 
Um, and that was, you know, we weren't going to paint the dome as Jefferson proposed, obviously, um, but instead we used projectors. Um, and, you know, so basically we, we, we painted the celestial map onto the dome uh, in light instead of, you know, plaster and pigments. Um, so, okay, so that, that was sort of the, the, the transition, right? We got the funding, we decided how we were going to do it. Um, we knew we were going to have to get projectors, um, but I think before we looked at what kind of equipment we were going to buy, and I'm, I'm going to get to that, we had to answer the question of what the celestial image like, on the dome was going to look like, right? Uh, unfortunately, Jefferson and Madeline did a really nice job of, of sharing those notes that he makes in his journal. You know, he, do, he doesn't make any mention of the style of the, of the map. He just says, you know, it's, it's going to be a representation of the night sky. Um, and we really only have that schematic drawing. Um, so uh, that was kind of daunting, um, but thrilling, uh, given that it was going to be up to us to kind of determine the style of the projection. Um, but, you know, besides that, um, you know, besides deciding what it was going to look like, we also had to figure out you know, how we were going to set the projectors up so that everything was kind of fully automated, right? So we didn't have to be there every night to turn it on. So these are sort of the technical hurdles that we encountered. Um, so uh, on, on the first question of, you know, what it was going to look like, we ended up going back to our research uh, in the university's library. Um, and in the first catalog of the library that was printed in 1828, so just two years after the rotunda opened, there's an entry for this book. Um, and there's the, the book itself is on the lower right, that's the title page, but it's um, John Flamsteed's Celestial Atlas. Um, sorry if you all can hear my dog. Um, so it was originally printed in 1729. Uh, a second edition was actually acquired for the library. Um, and so, uh, uh, so this is this is the book, right? This is the primary astronomical text that Jefferson orders for the university's first library before his death, right? Um, you know, and I think that's an indication that he viewed it as kind of the indispensable work for studying astronomy. Um, anyway, and this this catalog confirms that a copy of this book was in the rotunda when it opened in 1826. Right? So you probably can can predict where, where this line of thinking is leading. Um, but the choice of what the dome was going to look like was kind of an easy one to make, right? Um, and deciding the style, um, it seemed natural that the images that we were projecting on the ceiling would be those that an early student at UVA would have studied um, in the library, right? So um, in other words, you know, if a student you know, enrolled in 1827, wanted to learn about constellations, you know, they would go into the library and take this book and look at these images, right? This is what they would have had, had access to. Um, so the task then, you know, if we identified the, the source of the images, the task was then to convert uh, Flamsteed's really beautiful and very ornate um, plates of the night sky into a format and file type that could be, you know, adjusted to look natural and appropriately scaled when projected on the night sky. So, you know, the idea was to go to sort of move from this, which is a pretty detailed image to this, right, which is the final product. Um, so, you know, surprisingly, I think, I think we were a little bit scared by this prospect initially, because there's a lot of lines, a lot of, you know, uh, visual information to, to kind of trace out. It was surprisingly, I think this was easier than, than we initially thought. So, you know, the first, the first thing was to gather high resolution scans of Flamsteed's plates. So here's an example of one um, with Cepheus and Cassiopeia and Draco. Um, and then we basically imported these high res scans into Adobe Illustrator uh, and basically just uh, traced everything um, as accurately as possible. Uh, not only the lines of the, the constellations, but also the placement of the stars. Um, we decided to omit the you know, uh, ecliptic lines uh, and coordinate lines um, just because we felt it would be cluttering um, you know, the information out. But anyway, so we, we traced things to get this, right? That's, that's what the image looked like. Um, and then eventually we assigned that image to one of the projectors. There were five of them. And um, it ended up looking something like this, a sort of... Um, keystone shape. Um, so 
we had originally tried to follow Jefferson's notes um, that called for you know, the stars and constellations to be golden yellow on blue ground. Uh, but in our early test, we kind of found that the color was really washed out in the semi-darkness of the dome room. So, um, you know, we went with white and black. We, we felt that like the depth of, or the apparent depth of the black background was, it was a little bit more evocative. And um, we really wanted to feel as though you were looking through the dome into the night sky and not at an image uh, of the night sky on the dome. Um, and I think, you know, the, the reason for this was, um, more than aesthetic, you know, it looks good, I think, uh, the final product, but we also placed, we positioned everything in these panels um, on the dome uh, so that the constellations and stars would actually be um, at the appropriate points in the sky, uh, such that, you know, it, it's a representation of the night sky and uh, as it would have appeared in October, 1826. So, you know, had an early student who had enrolled in 1827 or 1826, uh, if they attended the sort of ribbon cutting ceremony uh, of the rotunda and stayed out late at night and looked up, this is the night sky they would have seen on that night, right? So, um, you know, I can, I can kind of wax poetic on this, but suffice to say, it's, it's uh, the projection is designed to be a kind of portal onto the past in, in more ways than one. Um, so that was simple enough, right? Getting Flamsteed's images to work with the projectors, getting them into a digital format that we could work with. Um, and like I said, there, there are five panels, uh, each one assigned to one of five projectors. Um, so what was left after doing that was the careful sort of calibration of everything um, so that the seams in between the five panels uh, were basically imperceptible, uh, which required some sort of like careful overlapping. Uh, and we also had to kind of uh, modify the shape of the panels so that the distortion caused by the curvature of the dome was minimized. Um, so, you know, doing this required quite a bit of careful measurement and preparation. So here we are um, during installation, kind of measuring out the circumference of the dome, making sure that um, the projector, the projectors would be sort of equidistant. Um, uh, so with yeah, so with the images done, um, we had to decide uh, the equipment to use, right? So, um, and this meant wading through some pretty technical uh, projector specifications, um, you know, things like foot candles and lumens and resolution and uh, you know, bulb life. Uh, so I'll spare, I'll spare you from all that. Um, but we eventually decided on the Epson PowerLight 500 uh, which there it is. Uh, and it's a fairly basic projector. There's nothing really special about it. Um, the two deciding factors is that it's very bright and it has a really long bulb life. So it would be um, the operating costs to be really low over the long term to keep this thing running basically every night for multiple hours every night. Um, you know, we were obviously less interested in things like color accuracy or resolution because we were basic. We were only uh, projecting, you know, white lines on black background. Um, so this wasn't wasn't exactly cinematic content. Although we've talked about having, like, movie nights on the dome of the rotunda, so maybe that that might still happen. Um, so what else do I want to say about that? So you can see in this picture that there's like a. It's fairly dim. I'm sorry, but you can see that the projector is sitting on this piece of plywood. Uh, and those are actually custom built stands that we designed and, and made. Um, the idea was we didn't want to um, drill into any part of the rotunda. They wouldn't have let us do that anyway. So this, it's just an L shape uh, and it allows the projector to sit um, securely kind of on the ledge, which is in the upper gallery of the rotunda. I don't know, um, I'm sure all of us have at least been inside the rotunda, but there's the, sort of middle gallery that you can get to, uh, students study in that space a lot, but then uh, access through a uh, ladder is the upper gallery and that's where the projectors are. Um, okay, so um, again, choosing projectors, I feel like this was pretty simple. And Madeline, you, know, you, can, you, you can disagree, but this is kind of you know, basic stuff where we just needed projectors, we needed five of them given the circumference of the dome. Um, the difficult task, I think, particularly for us, um, given that none of us, the three of us don't have experience with coding or networking audiovisual equipment. Um, the difficult part was figuring out, you know, how to link the five projectors um, and automate them on a daily cycle so that they would turn on at sunset every night and remain on until the rotunda closed. Um, 
and you know, I'm conscious of the time. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to get into details of how we did all that, like in Q&A, but um, suffice to say that we decided to power uh, each projector with a Raspberry Pi. I think I have a slide of that. So that's that's a Raspberry Pi. We The model we used is the 3B plus. Um, and what it is, is just a tiny computer. It's a PC. Uh, it has an HDMI out, which you know feeds into the projector. Uh, and a LAN port, which was important because we ended up networking everything together. Uh, and we were able to power the Raspberry Pis over LAN, which is great. So we didn't have to have, um, you know, a power cable for every unit, um, which, you know, reduced the risk of fire, which, you know, given the Rotunda's history was important. Um, anyway, so, um, uh, so yeah, so the, 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 and the other advantage of the Raspberry Pi is it's, it's open architecture and you can, you can, um, program it to really do anything you want, right? Um, so, you know, linking, what we did was um, we linked everything together, as I said, over LAN. We linked the five Raspberry Pis. The Raspberry Pis controlled the projectors um, so that the final kind of setup was this thing here. So you can see that, you know, on the right was a laptop, which was, uh, which is, so it's still up there, is still running um, Epson's kind of proprietary automation software. So that prompts the, the projectors to turn on at a given time. Uh, and then the Raspberry Pi is one for each of the projectors basically serves the appropriate image, the appropriate panel to the projector as soon as it turns on. Uh, and everything communicates with everything else through that LAN port, which is, which is in the middle, that LAN switch. Um, so anyway, uh, again, I can get into details later, but I, I think what I'll just end by saying that what I'm most proud of is the fact that we were able to figure out how to code the Raspberry Pis um, so that even in the event of a power outage, right, uh, when power was restored, everything would return to the default settings, right? So we wouldn't have to keep checking on it uh, in the event of a power outage, um, you know, they would just turn on, call up their assigned images, and all the the Flamsteed panels would project uh, as as they needed to every night. Um, and that's that's the schedule we're running things on, at least up until the pandemic kind of disrupted things. Um, basically, at sunset, the projectors come on, the dome lights dim, and the projection stays on um, during study hours, which is the time at night when UVA students are able to go into the rotunda and work without the distraction of tour groups and public events uh, being held in the dome room. Um, so I, I think I've actually gone way past time for which I'm sorry, Neil. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Neil, uh, but I say again, I'll, I'll welcome questions about any of the technical aspect of what I just discussed uh, and uh, happy to talk about implementation further. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so in the time that we have left, I'm going to speak a little bit more about the history of the rotunda and share some of the key ideas that informed the paired exhibition that we designed, as well as some of the programming that we developed, not computer programming, event programming. Um, so Sam, so slide, <laughs> Sam alluded to an event that we're uh, you know, all likely familiar with. Uh, in October of 1895, fire engulfed the University of Virginia's library erasing decades of history and burning many, though, as Sam said, not all of the library's books. The site of a burning library is an inherently disturbing one, but it was especially devastating for UVA. The rotunda, of course, forms the next slide, the central node of UVA's original campus. And by placing a library rather than a church at the heart of his university, Jefferson had sought to enshrine knowledge and learning as core institutional values. Now the material artifacts of those values were going up in smoke. So perhaps in response to the fire's destruction, um, scholarship on the Rotunda Library has tended to focus on its catalogs. And this work has revealed a trove of information about um, how UVA's first library was organized on the page. However, surprisingly little is known about the material histories of the library's books or about the library's history as a lived space. So as Madeline made clear, when the Rotunda building opened in 1826, slide, its three stories boasted classrooms, laboratories, laboratories, a museum, and in the dorm room, a library. So the driving objective of our exhibition and programming was to make the Rotunda's history as a site of interactive learning, visible, approachable, and imaginatively engaging to students, alumni, and members of the public. 
The recently completed rotunda renovations, while beautiful and necessary, obscure and elide the rotunda's full past. So using archival research and the digital methods of display that Sam detailed, we aimed to resuscitate this past, but also provide a locus for the entire university community to make connections between past and present. So the exhibition called Rotunda Planetarium, Science and Learning in the University of Virginia's First Library, thank you, Sam, was developed in collaboration with Rare Book School and grouped in three thematic sections across six individual shelving units in the Rotunda Dome Room. The three sections of this exhibition called Planetarium, Museum, Library, were designed to reflect the range of materials once displayed on the Rotunda's shelves and signaled the premium that the three of us, like as, not only as scholars, but as teachers, you know, uh, place on physical objects as pedagogical tools and sources of historical knowledge. So the artifacts in the planetarium section of our exhibition sketched the story of astronomy education in the early United States slide. Sometimes known as the imperial science, astronomy is a discipline whose insights are crucial to activities of conquest, including maritime navigation and map making. At the University of Virginia, astronomy occupied a prominent place in the early curriculum. The Rotunda Library housed cutting edge, cutting edge theoretical texts, as well as telescopes, sextants, and other scientific instruments for more practical instruction. However, astronomy also has a long tradition of amateur involvement. Thinkers and scientists outside the academy slide, including the free African-American polymath Benjamin Banneker pursued astronomical, astronomical interests with passion, though often in the face of prejudice and restricted resources. So one object from the planetarium section of the exhibition that I would like to highlight is an almanac created by, on the next slide, Nathaniel Ames in the mid 18th century. So almanacs, of course, are annual publications that provided 18th and 19th century readers with information about weather forecasts, tide tables, e eclipse dates, and sometimes more specialized advice. In other words, they communicated astronomical knowledge to non-academic audiences. We can see that this edition of Ames's Almanac even features a cover image that depicts the solar system and the path of a comet. Inside the Almanac contains a short article about comets and planets. Pretty cool. So the next section of the exhibition called Museum, on the next slide, told the story of the expansive collection of natural history specimens, anatomical preparations, fossils, mineralogical samples, and Native American native artifacts uh, once held in the rotunda. First displayed in one of the oval rooms on the rotunda's second floor, this museum was eventually relocated to the upper gallery in 1841 destroyed in the 1895 fire, nothing of this collection survives, and we know of its existence only through archival evidence and contemporary inventories and descriptions of the space. So the books, objects, and curiosities that we gathered for the exhibition, uh, you know, provided a speculative and imaginative reconstruction of what the Rotunda's museum looked like during its um, 15 years of use. So it's difficult to choose just one object to highlight from the museum section of our exhibition. And I apologize for not having a clear image. Um, you know, we had to skedaddle out of the, out of the space um, sooner than we anticipated and <laughs> didn't get all the photos that we wanted. Um, but yeah, circle there uh, is a fossil mastodon tooth, which we were lucky enough to borrow um, from the collection of Dr. Robert Chevalier. Uh, so fossil remains of the mastodon were subject to debate in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, in the notes on the state of Virginia, Jefferson speculated about what was then called the American incognitum, the American unknown. Jefferson believed that this incognitum was still alive, perhaps in the then unexplored reaches of the American West. This was in keeping with Jefferson's skepticism about extinction and geologic change. Uh, writing to John Emmett, the university's first professor of chemistry and natural history, Jefferson remarked that such theories were too idle to be worth a single hour of any man's life. So the last, se last section of the exhibition dealt with the history of the Rotunda's library um, on the next slide. And as we all know, you know, Jefferson, or as we may all know, Jefferson compiled a list of titles that would eventually fill the shelves of the Durham Room, and books were initially kept in P Pavilion 7 as they arrived from Europe, 
and were then arrayed around the Rotunda's dome room when construction finished in 1826. Some 8,100 volumes lined the library's shelves upon its opening, organized by subject and size in cases that looked very much like those that ringed the Rotunda's perimeter today. Uh, the galleries were eventually also packed with, as you can see, uh, packed with books to accommodate this formidable and rapidly growing collection. So the library section um, of our exhibition was you know, largely informed by research that we conducted for our allied project that Sam mentioned, Rotunda Library Online, which is a, and this is next slide, which is a searchable online public database of every book shelved in the Rotunda Library when it opened in 1826. You can find that at the URL listed at the top. So on the next slide, uh, we just have an infographic that was prominently displayed in the exhibition. It shows which books uh, listed in the Rotunda Library's uh, first printed catalog survived the 1895 fire. As you can see, approximately 3,000 volumes or about 37% of the collection survived and, you know, a much higher rate than previously uh, believed. So that's after hours and hours in special collections, we were able to, um, you know, uncover some interesting new evidence. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, we revealed our exhibition during our November 2019 launch symposium, which convened scholars from UVA and Harvard to take part, you know, in some great discussions about the history of science, architecture, and race at UVA and in early America at large. Um, and speakers prompted some really interesting questions, such as how can 21st century buildings recontextualize their spaces to engage their history? Um, so it's our hope that some of those conversations begun under the dome room are going to continue to um, develop in the coming years. And I think on the next slide, we have an image of our keynote speaker, Sarah Schechner. Yes, there we go, packed house. Um, so next slide, uh, we organized six public viewing nights for the planetarium, which were attended by a total of over 5,000 people, you know, across all the, not 5,000 a night, but across all six nights. So many of whom were students. Um, and on the next slide, uh, you know, we can see many Charlottesville area residents attended our public nights as well. Um, some told us they had never set foot in the rotundas, uh, in, in the rotunda before visiting the planetarium, which is pretty amazing. Um, and thanks to the Jefferson Trust support, visitors attended all our public nights for free, you know, a feature that almost certainly um, contributed to a significant number of repeat visitors. Um, so a few of our public nights, the last thing I want to say, a few of our public nights featured um, special guest visitors, including violinist on the next slide, I think of, uh, yes, there we go. And Jefferson era historian, David McCormick, who at our February 1st, 2020 public night performed a concert of music likely heard by Thomas Jefferson at Monticello. Um, and then on the 27th of that month, on the next slide, we, we hosted our last public night, uh, um, supported by the Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures and UVA students and Charlottesville area residents gathered under the Dome Room Stars to enjoy performances by UVA acapella groups, the Academical Village people and Who's in the Stairwell. It was pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, that, that concludes uh, the, the main part of our talk. We're, we're eager to hear your questions. Um, you know, and just as a, as a parting note, like uh, we, we also look forward to forming new collaborations and supporting different uses of our installation. So with the projectors installed in the dome room for the foreseeable future, student groups, for example, could use, could choose to transform the dome room ceiling um, in other ways. So we're always excited to hear ideas about that. And thank you. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you so much for that phenomenal uh, presentation. It was really, really lovely to learn more about your project, about your research to recontextualize the Rotunda's history. This was a fantastic a presentation. I know I'm someone where I regret that I was not able to be present in Charlottesville and won't be in Charlottesville for quite a long time to see this symposium live. So this virtual presentation of it is really, really lovely. We are reaching audience Q&A portion, so I'm going to facilitate that for you all. We've had a couple questions that have been submitted in advance, which I'll begin with, but I can see the chat starting to blow up. We love to keep those coming. When you ask your questions, it would be wonderful if you would also include in addition to your name, but where you're calling in from and 
perhaps your relationship to the university or a class year or something like that. We at the Virginia Club of New York are based out of New York City, but one of the really fun components of our virtual programming is that folks are calling in from all over. So if you want to share a little bit about where you're coming in from, that would be lovely. One of our questions submitted in advance for our presenters is what interaction or advice did you seek from the astronomy department for your effort? And this question comes from Wynn. And any three of you are welcome to dive in and take it away. I'm sure all three of us probably have something to say on this question. Um, yeah, we, we did meet with a couple people in the astronomy department fairly early on in planning the project, um, particularly Ricky Patterson, who's involved in some of the public programming that the McCormick Observatory puts on. Um, and we had sort of toyed with the idea of combining like, you know, a public event at the observatory and a public night at the, rot the, in the rotunda. Uh, and I hope that we do more of that in future. But I think, um, you know, the point that we keep making is this was never meant to be a sort of modern planetarium like the Hayden or something, right? This is, it's not really um, a fully accurate representation of the night sky. Um, it's not dynamic. It doesn't move, at least not yet. Um, so, you know, we, we were mainly interested in the sort of historical evidence that we were bringing um, to the project. And, you know, that's why we, we've uh, build it as a reconstruction, right? It's really something, it's a realization of something that was never fully finished, right? As we know. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm sure Mad Madeline and Neil, do you have anything else to contribute? I would just add that um, in terms of the exhibition itself, we benefited enormously from um, partnerships with local collectors who collect astronomical instruments and globes. Um, and as a you know, result of their generosity and support for the project, we were able to display some of those instruments, many of which are similar to the instruments that Jefferson purchased for the early university um, as part of the exhibition. So that, that was really cool. And I think, um, you know, we got it a sense of what was kind of cutting edge astronomical technology in the 19th century, if, if not in the 21st. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I'll just jump in really quick. I should, uh, Neil mentioned um, um, one of the donors to the exhibition, but I should mention Jack Kester. Uh, he's, he's a collector of astronomical instruments and he was a really generous um, yeah, lender to the, to the um, exhibition. So I'm glad you brought that up, Madeline, thanks. Thank you. We have another question from one of our alumni our alums, Mark, um, and he asked if you could maybe expound upon some of the barriers to Jefferson's initial vision for this celestial dome coming to fruition and, and what prevented him from bringing this vision to life. Madeline, do you want to take that? I feel like that's, that's sort of your... Sure, well, I, I can get started, but... Um... Feel, feel free to jump in because I'm probably going to leave something out. I mean, I think cost really was an issue. Um, as, as I alluded to, Jefferson, you know, late in the game was still looking around for someone to do that painting on the dorm room ceiling. Um, the fact that he would have had to bring someone from Europe and pay for them to stay in Charlottesville for months, um, you know, not to mention paying for supplies, uh, I think, you know, could have been prohibitive. Um, but it's also possible that, uh, you know, he decided to prioritize the library and certainly some of the biggest expenditures of the early university went to buying the uh, first library's book collection. So when the Rotunda Library opens in 1826, it has some, you know, 8,000 volumes in the collection. And at that point in 19th century America, that was a huge collection, even compared to much older universities like Harvard that had been collecting books for many more years. Um, so, so I think, yeah, the, the questions of sort of cost and technical difficulty, but also somewhere in there, a decision to prioritize the library may have accounted for that shift, but we, we really don't know for sure. It's 
Sam, Neil, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I mean, on the, on the topic of cost, because um, that's right, I think that was the primary limiting factor. Um, but there's actually correspondence that um, that survives from uh, William and Hilliard, who's the bookseller that actually supply, supplies the books that form the first library. And um, I think I think the university, uh, you know, granted him eighteen thousand dollars or something was a which was an astronomical sum, no pun intended, at the time. Um, but you get letters from him sent to Jefferson, and it's obvious that he's. Uh, He's, he's uncomfortable admitting that he's probably not going to be able to buy all the books that Jefferson wanted uh, with that money. So uh, when uh, William Hilliard terminates their contract, um, you get the sense that not all the books that, that Jefferson ordered were actually delivered. Um, so yeah, they, they definitely ran up uh, against the, the really high cost of assembling the library itself. And then, you know, the, the other point that we have to make is, um, the ultimate limiting factor is mortality, right? And Jefferson died before the rotunda opened. And when he came to visit um, the dome room, the dome was unfinished, right? Uh, it was on plaster. I think there was actually still holes in it. So there was like rain coming in. Um, so, you know, he might've had this idea, but he, he might've had to sort of let go of it, realizing that it was gonna be up to him to make it happen, to sort of see it through. And, you know, it wasn't meant to be, so that. It's always nice to know a little bit more context about what squashed the dreams. Vicki from Richmond asks a very exciting question. She asked if you'll consider offering virtual renditions, if that's something that you've considered, obviously with the pandemic, hopefully winding down within the next year or so, if, if you've thought of virtual presentations before the pandemic into Charlottesville. Yeah, yeah, um, we haven't considered that. I, I'm hesitant. To, I mean, I, I think that there's the advantage of you know, making it available to more people online, but we hesitate to do that because it, the, the power of the experience is really like standing under it, right? Um, and unfortunately, um, the rotunda basically shut down, like especially at the beginning of the pandemic, from what I understand. And we've been working with rotunda staff, um, trying trying to plan, you know, when we're gonna start offering public nights again. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I don't see why we couldn't have, you know, a socially distant, fairly safe public night uh, because that space is so large. Um, but no, we, we haven't, we haven't thought about that, but maybe we should revisit the idea of like maybe a, um, a webcam view of the projection or something. Well, we always love when our events get folks uh, thinking about new ideas and new ways of engaging. I'm going to try and synthesize several questions because in the chat there is overwhelmingly positive reaction to this project. Lots of folks saying they wish that they were in Charlottesville to see this, wish that they had seen it. A couple of really wonderful suggestions from alums to show this at a reunions weekend or something of that nature. So we'll be sure to try and bump that up to the powers that be, see if we can bring that to fruition. But I wondered if maybe the three of you could speak about your own visions about who you hope to bring into this project. You obviously had very successful public launches. If you've thought about what other renditions of this will look like, whether it's you know briefer symposiums or a long-term project. So feel free to kind of muse about what your plans for the future are for this project. Um, well, I'll just I'll just respond to that idea that you know one thing we were really interested in making sure was a fe was a feature of the rotunda planetarium was that you know it became kind of a permanent fixture of the rotunda um, and it is that right um, the rotunda uh, staff knows how to turn everything on how to make the adjustments and basically uh, it's now an option if you have an event in the rotunda and it's actually been turned on for you know alumni events or dinners in that space um, it, you really only can turn it on at night because the ambient light, in the space and daytime, you know, it kind of washes everything out. Um, but yeah, that was always an idea. We want we want this to be um, a feature that that the UVA community, Charlottesville community, can can use, you know, when and as needed. Um, Lovely, Neil and Madeline. Do you want to share a little bit, maybe, about your own personal dreams for this project? Well, we've we've been trying to, you know. I'll always, always think of like new collaborators and, and actually, you know, the David McCormick event, I mean, something like that, where we can just take advantage of all of the like multimedia opportunities, you know, that, that are created by the space. Um, and, you know, 
uh, David's David's performance, you know, paired with the the background of the of the dome ceiling was really amazing. Um, but also, I think as you know, both Sam and Madeline mentioned in their answers to one of the earlier questions is that um, you know potential collaboration with somebody who actually knows a lot about astronomy, you know, cur current astronomy, and and how to maybe use the projectors to um, to project something that's you know scientifically accurate or educational which which you know we were aiming for um strictly in historical um, reconstruction so somebody could take it in that direction and, and that's kind of beyond us so we would need help with that yeah and i'll just add that um one of and i i can't remember if you mentioned this neil but one of the groups that we collaborated with um for one of our public nights is a group called Dark Skies, Bright Kids, um, which is a kind of K through 12 astronomy engagement um, program run by graduate students in the UVA astronomy department. And they have a lot of um, ties with kind of STEM education in the Charlottesville community. And they were gracious enough to come in and do some activities with younger visitors at one of the public nights. And I think they, they would certainly be interested um, in using the projection as a teaching tool. Um, and then I, I think something else that we've discussed too is you know, making the projectors available for other um, projects, you know, whether they are in architecture or art um, to, to, to use that projection technology to kind of reinscribe the dome room in a different way than we have, um, and to keep kind of you know uncovering its narratives and offering new ones in the space. Um, so we we hope to to see something like that. And I we've been working on kind of a, a transition plan and you know manual for how to use the projectors so that we can pass that knowledge along to other people. Well, that sounds lovely, and I'm so inspired by the creative nature of this project and how you you think about all of these different narratives that you can incorporate. So this was a lovely evening. I wanna thank our audience for joining us tonight, for spending part of your evening with us. We hope that we can all at some point see this wonderful presentation in the Rotunda Dome Room at some point um, in the hopefully not too far off future. But in the meantime, we would love to see any and all of you at future Virginia Club virtual events. So we look forward to more conversations that are fulfilling and fruitful with wonderful scholars like the three folks we had here tonight. Have a great night, you all. Thank you all.